Hello and welcome to Sunday Night Conversations brought to you by D1Baseball.com. I want to say special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Netting Pros. Netting Pros specializes in the design, fabrication, and installation of custom netting and padding for college baseball programs all around the country. The next time your field or facility needs something new, whether that's netting, wall padding, L screens, or ball carts, make sure you check out our friends at Netting Pros. We say this every week. These guys are amazing. They have incredible products. They love our sport. Just want to encourage everyone to support them uh, with whatever you need. You will not be disappointed. Those guys are awesome. So thanks again to them. Uh, I am your host, Michael Patrick Rooney. If you, uh, you're you joining us for the first time on Sunday Night Conversations, these are really just fun conversations about college baseball. A couple of years ago, we did this as a, as, as a way to just kind of meet the volunteer coaches in college baseball who are, you know, had always been working so hard behind the scenes. Uh, we're, we're grateful that now we don't even have volunteer coaches anymore. Yeah, schools have the option to make those paid coaches and put them on the road for recruiting. Last year, we did stuff that was more thematic. You know, we did hitting, we did base running, we did outfield play, we did catching, we did pitching, we did pitching several times. Um, and that was really fun. This year is it, just, you know, I'm just kind of brainstorming on what would be really fun topics. So this is this this is like the year of Coach Rooney, it's just me being very selfish things that, uh, that that speak to me. And that's why tonight, you can see, we've got John Yurko, head coach at Penn. We've got Dr. Barry Davis, the head coach at Ryder. Uh, what these guys and their programs have in common is they're based in uh, the Philly area, I'll call it, the, the mid-Atlantic, the tri-state, New Jersey, Philadelphia. I, Barry, I don't know if you're officially a Philadelphia Eagles fan, but I always assume that. John, I know that you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan. So anyway, these guys were, their programs were amazing in the NCAA tournament this year, you know, obviously I get to do the squeeze play stuff and, you know, we're following all 16 regionals and, and the Penn Quakers and the Ryder Bronx were all over our screen. So super fired up to have these guys. Hey, uh, John, I'm going to start with you. Uh, and then, um, and then Barry will come to you and, and I want you guys to just kind of bullet point your resumes. So, you know, where'd you grow up? Where'd you play? Where'd you coach that type of thing? Before we do that though, I am assuming that you guys have nicknames. Most coaches have nicknames. I always think Mark Marquis was called nine. Mike Martin was called 11. Uh, Jim Morris was called three. So Barry, I think your nickname, if I'm playing for you, I'm probably calling you Doc. Is that is that true or false? <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I don't know what they call me behind my back. <laughs> That's a good so, point. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've always just, they've just called me, they always say coach. I mean. Coach, um, okay, that works. You know, and that's, you know, I'm sure there's something that, that goes on, you know, behind in the locker room that, that, yeah. but, um, as a, as a player, uh, they, I mean, I was, some people would call me chili because they would use me, you know, it's a chili Davis that played, oh, um, nice. you know, that, that was it. But as far as a coach, it was all, it was always just, just coach, coach Davis. Yeah, that works. Well, plus it takes a while to become a doctor, right? So it's like, this is a, uh, you know, yeah, that's, that takes a minute. So. Uh, John, I would imagine Yerks or what's everybody go with for you? Yeah, it's usually Yerk um, or JY. Like, like Barry said, that's at least what they say to my face. So uh, <laughs> I guess we'll stick with those two for now. That's great. All right. So Yerk, you go first. Uh, tell us where you grew up, where you played, where you've coached so far. Yeah, um, I'm originally from the Northeast. I was born in Philadelphia, um, grew up in South Jersey. Uh, I had the privilege of going to Gloucester Catholic High School, local high school here in the area. Um, and then, you know, I went to Rowan University, played college ball there. And uh, as, I was, as I was finishing up uh, school and student teaching, I got into coaching. I coached at Rowan for two years. Um, and then I moved on to Duke, went down to Duke. I was a volunteer assistant there. and was fortunate enough to get promoted. I, I was there from like 2001 to 2005. Um, at that point, I came back to Penn uh, to work under John Cole to be the recruiting coordinator. Um, I actually played under John Cole at Rowan's. So that was where the connection was and came back and uh, I was an assistant coach for seven years at Penn and I took over as a head coach 10 years ago. So pretty much most of my time in the Northeast outside of those four years I lived in Durham. That's awesome. Hey, uh, uh, two follow-up questions. Who, who'd you, uh, who, what staff was that at Duke? Was it the Hilliers or were you after the it, Hilliers? It was, I, I was, I was lucky oh, enough to coach under Bill Hillier. Um, who's, who was awesome. Learned a ton from him. Um, uh, just a great, great human being. There's still a lot of times that, uh, 
you know, when things pop up today, I often ask myself how he would handle certain situations. So yeah, I was lucky to, to, to work under him. Gotcha. And then Gloucester Catholic also means Brooklawn American Legion. And that's the Barths, like, like, you know, that the Barths, I would can, maybe I'm overstating this, but they almost feel like the first family of New Jersey baseball. Maybe there's a different way to say that, but um, I, I'm assuming you that's who you played for, right? The Barths, like one, one of the brothers for the high school season and one for the summer season. Is that how it would work? Yeah, I was lucky enough to play for them all, actually. Um, Dennis Dennis Barth was my high school coach my junior and senior year. He also helped out with the Legion program. And Joe Barth Sr. was running running the Legion program. And Joe Barth Jr. was also helping out and Steve Mondial. So it was a cast of characters, but they were, uh, as Barry knows, they're they really good baseball guys. So I was really lucky. How you're, Did any of your Brooklyn Legion teams uh, do serious damage, like go deep in the summer? Yeah, I think um, we went to one American Legion World Series. We got up beaten. I went, we went to a regional every year, so it was a great experience. I think mm-hmm. my junior year, I from high school to to Legion, I think I played over a hundred and like fifteen games, something something like that. We played like seventy some games in Legion ball that summer, so it's great experience. It's awesome. So good. Oh, I, I told you guys before we hit record, like I remember being a young high school coach in the Philly area, going to clinics. And I, as I told you, I, I thought the bars actually invented baseball. Like I didn't even like Abner double day. Sorry, but like these guys clearly invented the game. It was, it was so awesome. So doc Davis, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia and, um, went to college at Bridgewater college, which is a division three school. Graduated there, wanted to be a college coach. I uh, was a graduate assistant at George Mason University under Billy Brown for one year. Uh, then I moved to Frostburg State, which I wanted to attend the fir- in the first year, but uh, they didn't have a GA position. And then I worked under Bob Wells, who I consider, and, and Billy Brown was amazing too, an amazing organ- organizer, and I learned a lot from him. Um, but Bob Wells is probably one of the most underrated coaches uh, in, in America. I mean, he taught me, you know, so much about game management and things. So I was at Frostburg for a year and I, um, I got, I was fortunate enough to get, uh, the junior college job at Gloucester County college. You're throwing Gloucester out quite a bit here tonight and, uh, Gloucester County college right down the street from Gloucester Catholic. Um, so, uh, I, I knew John, I saw John Yurko play. So when I was recruiting, but I was at Gloucester County for 11 years, uh, we had some success, uh, I, I moved on to Georgia Southwestern State University in Americus, Georgia for four years. I was there from 2001 to 2004, and I was fortunate enough to get the job at Ryder University uh, after Sonny Patero left. Um, and I've been at in New Jersey or at Ryder since the fall of 2004. This is my 20th year and my 35th year as a head coach and my 31st year of working in New Jersey, which if you would have told me that when I was 18 or 19 years old, I would have said there is no way I am <laughs> going to live in New Jersey and work in New Jersey. But here I am uh, and 35 years uh, later uh, and still doing it. Mm, that's so good. Hey, and, and and we need to say this, like arguably the most underrated baseball state in the country. I mean, you know, did give birth to Mike Trout and Todd Frazier and a million other really good players. Hey, so Barry, the um, Coach Wells, is he still with us or is he passed? Yes. Yes. Uh, Coach Wells, Bob Wells, he was a graduate of uh, Rhode Island uh, University, University of Rhode Island. And I, and I believe he's still he lives up in, the, in that area. Um, I mean, it, it just uh, I mean, when I when I left Frostburg, I had Billy Brown with who who knew baseball, his brother, Mike Brown pitched in the big leagues for the Boston Red Sox. You might remember Mike Brown, mm-hmm. but Billy, Billy uh, took over. And, and it's funny because I was 22 years old and I looked up to Billy as like, he was, you know, he'd been around, Billy was 31, you know, <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he was, uh, he was 31 years old. So he was still a young coach, but he was very organized. Very, I mean, schedule to the minute. And I, and I, you know, I kept those schedules and I, and I tried to mirror that and use that. And then Wells was just a, I mean, strategy, I mean, way ahead in the game. I mean, he knew the game. He coached Jimmy Riggleman. Riggleman was a big league manager for years. Yeah. Uh, Riggleman played under Wells. Um, Wells should be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, it, I mean, but he doesn't, he doesn't want the spotlight. I mean, he was a teacher. He's a professor at Frostburg State. But 
they, I mean, we, we were much like Brooklawn. If you, and now I didn't know Brooklawn at the time until I got there, Brooklawn Gloucester Catholic, but Wells was a funda fundamentals. Um, he just knew the game and, uh, you know, he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot of things, um, that, that have paid off for me, um, you know, in education as well, because he was, a um, he was a very smart man and, uh, he, he knew, he knew baseball. He he's amazing. That's awesome. Hey, and, and, uh, last follow up on th this part. So the gloss, like you were being humble on the Gloucester County, you know, uh, junior college experience. Like that was a factory where you guys were a, a legit division three powerhouse, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, when, when they went to divisions, which, which they should have, because we didn't have scholarships, um, we won four world series when I was there and, and they're still good. They're still very good. Mm -hmm. They won it last year. Um, and uh, where was the World Mike, Series when you were your teams were going? Was it was it rotating? It was uh, we played our first the first few years in Jamestown, New York. Um, and then we played uh, a few more years in Batavia, New York, and they've moved it around now. I, I mean, I, they've had it in Tennessee. They've had it in Texas. I mean, Division three now has grown a little bit more when we first were there. It wasn't as as as, as deep as it as it is now. But uh, we had some some really really good teams and um you know it was it was it was a good it, for me it was it was perfect because i mean there was nothing there i mean we didn't have dugouts we we you know the fence was three foot high all the way around the backstop was falling down and uh i told somebody you know years later i said that was perfect for me because nobody uh, really now i didn't say they cared uh they, but i was allowed to basically do what i wanted and at 20, I was a head coach at 24. I mean, you talk about making mistakes. I mean, I could make mistakes and, and, and my boss would, would work with me. I mean, Ron Case was, was unbelievable with me in terms of uh, letting me make those mistakes and, and mentoring me and guiding me, not so much with the baseball part, but just the other things, dealing with people sure. and that type of thing. So I got a chance to, to make trial and error was, was, really, was really the way that I learned a lot, um, you know, starting that young. That's so great. Love it. All right. So you're, let me come back to you. So um, that was really good. The um, here's what I want to do. So we're, we're going to dive into last year. I mean, last year, both of your programs, you know, were you generated national eyeballs. And I, and I, when I say generated, that's the wrong verb, like earned that, like what you guys did, you know, York in, in Auburn, you know, Barry, what you guys did at, in Conway at coastal was like, so compelling, but, as often as the case in sports, the story, like the audience jumps in in that moment, but the story had started previously. And for you, Yerk, like I want to, you know, 20 and 2020 is the pandemic season. No one plays a full season of college baseball. 2021, if I'm not mistaken, the Ivy League canceled baseball again while everyone else played. And then in 2022, you had a killer team, like a really good team. Now that team didn't get to go to the NCAA tournament. Uh, because obviously you got to win in the, you know, you got to win your Ivy League tournament, all that stuff. But that team did, if I'm not mistaken, like come right out of the shoot and win a series at Texas A&M after having taken two years off. So I'd love for you to kind of tell us a little bit about the 2022 store uh, team and, you know, even that A&M weekend, if I've got that right, if I don't, please correct that and how that led into the 2023 team. Yeah, uh, you do have that right, Runes. Um, I think actually, though, I, it, it started for us before COVID. I think, you know, we started doing some things different recruiting back in like 18. And I think you you just started seeing the, the fruits of those labor, you know, those labors, you know, the last couple of years. And, um, you know, I we felt like <clears throat> the 2018 team was, was a really good team. And there was there were some kids on that team that were freshmen and we went down to Duke and we were playing on a spring break trip and we played them twice midweek and we beat them twice midweek. And wow. from that point on, I just felt like our kids thought that they could go anywhere and, and compete against anybody in the country. And I think you have to give a lot of credit to the assistant coaches. Um, Josh Schwartz and Mike Santillo really did a good job finding kids that would fit what we're trying to do here at Penn. Um, you know, obviously we have to find a, pretty phenomenal student athlete here. Um, and I think, you know, the last couple of years, obviously COVID, we got shut down in 20, um, 21. We actually did play some games. We were the only Ivy league school that played games. It was a limited schedule, but 
I have to give a lot of credit to our AD and our president because none of the other Ivy League schools played that year. And, you know, take that to 22, and we we just we played great. I think we lost two series the entire year. Um, wow. you know, we opened up at AM, we beat AM on the road. Um, and then uh, we wound up, you know, we lost to Columbia in the in the tournament. Um, so we didn't get the NCAA bid. And, and I think guys really took that to heart coming in the last year. Um, you know, we had a lot of guys back. Um, we had our same three starting pitchers, weekend guys the entire year, and we had a really good bullpen. Um, and I think that was one of the things that really carried us, uh, you know, into, into the regional. And I don't think many people gave us a chance to go down there and compete. I'm sure it was similar with Barry. Um, and, you know, w- when we went down there, it's, I felt like our kids, they, they just felt like they could compete with anybody. And we, we pitched it really well. We played good defense and we had some timely hitting. So it was a great experience. Um, you know, I still feel like we we're maybe a couple plays away from actually pulling the whole thing off. So, um, you know, awesome no time for our program. Yeah. No. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll dive deeper. Like, like uh, uh spoiler alert, you and I are in a, in a few moments are going to unpack the 11th inning against Auburn like that, that whole thing, you know, we're, we're up in the studio in Connecticut watching that thing. And I'm basically losing my mind. You know, it was like, what an, un, not that I'm, I'm clearly not pulling. I mean, Auburn is one of the most likable programs in college baseball. Those guys are amazing, but obviously you're playing them at Auburn. It's the chance that, you know, it's, 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 that's not a small upset. So Barry, let's come to you. So I'm going to go two years back for you. Because in 2021, and I, again, please correct me if I if I conflate these years, but I believe 2021 was the year that Fairfield had this. And you play in the MAC with Fairfield, the Metro Atlantic. Fairfield has this crazy season, and I mean they go like they didn't lose until May, if I'm not mistaken. They're, they're like 33 and one at one point. They win 28 in a row, which you just don't see teams from New York or the MAC doing stuff like that. And then they were so good, they got an at-large bid, which doesn't typically happen in the conference. But you guys obviously were, were under that radar, under the Fairfield shadow. Uh, but you you won the automatic bid. And so, yeah, tell me about the 21 team or, you know, any of those private prior teams that kind of led into this year's team. Well, the, t- the team that, that we're, we're discussing um, was built in the summer of, for the most part, the core, a very large core, 10, 10 11 guys um was was recruited in 2018 which was on the on the heels of my worst season ever in no way. 30 whatever years uh, at the time and um we you know you, you know it's one of those things you know that i when i speak a little bit it's like reflection like on a daily basis on a weekly basis monthly basis annual what we have got to do something different. We've got to over recruit. We've got to, we've got to get more money. We've got to change our approach. We've got to bring in a mental performance coach, Brian Kane. We've got to do all these things. And we did all of that. And then COVID hit. Um, So the next year, you know, and, and John, you, you, Mike, you guys know this. I mean, everybody was like, okay, we're not going to play uh, out of conference games. We're not going to be able to travel down south. I mean, we had to cancel all of our games, and we only played conference games. And and Fairfield's team was amazing and, and, and really strong. Um, and throughout the course of the year, every team had, you know, a week, a weekend. And we played doubleheaders. We played a doubleheader on Saturday, a doubleheader on Sunday, every weekend conference and then two times during the season we would play a doubleheader on wednesday so there was there was a there was a stretch where you would play 16 innings on saturday 16 innings on sunday and 16 innings on wednesday and 16 innings on saturday and 16 innings on sunday and then 16 innings on wednesday and then if covid hit somebody the wrong way you'd be back playing Ooh. something else in the middle of the week and, <laughs> oh my and, gosh. and somebody would we had a whole weekend series canceled and then we got on the phone and they switched the schedule. We weren't even supposed to play somebody and we played some. So it was in, but I think we, we all hand as baseball people do, we all handle things very easily because we deal with rain. We deal with weather. We deal with travel. We go in vans, you know, we, we, you know, we don't stay in this, these types of great, you know, these hotels, you know, we don't have, you know, resources just falling all over us. We just got through the year 
And we were very lucky. We had 20, 20 what did we have? We had 18 wins in the conference. We were 18 and, and I believe 18 and 16. The percentages would have put us about fourth or fifth, but because of the way the rules were, the wins you were getting, you were getting, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The advantage to, because you won. That was the the bonus. You, the more right. you won, the better. So we ended up as a third seed, and we hosted uh, the first weekend. So the first weekend was best of three, and then the highest seeded winner would host. And of course, Fairfield was thirty three and one. And uh, you've been in a thousand tournaments in your life. You watched a thousand terms. The number one seed gets beat by the number four seed. And then we beat the number th uh, two seed. So all of a sudden now it's three and four. We win on a, on a base hit. John Volpe pinch hit base hit in the bottom of the ninth. I believe we win and then Fairfield fights their way through and then we get Fairfield in the championship. And of course they've played one extra game than us. And then we, you know, we had um, a kid who just, who, who, who just, you know, gutted it out. He actually got the win the day before against Canisius and he turns around and starts the game and, and finishes. And we were swept by Fairfield during the, during the year, um, totally just, you know, obliterated. I don't think we scored, but three or four runs the whole weekend. Um, and they were, they were so good. And, so and good. when they, and then and this is, I know Mike, you guys talk about John, you know, the, the RPI, the, you know, always controversial, you know, you know, what do we use? What do we don't, use? but Fairfield was like the fourth or fifth RPI, but they only played conference games. So it didn't make any sense because that the right. RPI really only really focuses on like who your opponents play, who you schedule, you know, you know, like so, but you can't keep a team out that has an RPI of four. No. You know, whether they just, you know, they deserve to be in there. Obviously, they, they ended up winning more games in the regional than we did. They won two games. They played two Texas, games, I believe, yeah. for the championship. Eliminated Arizona State. Yeah, like it was, yeah. yeah. Sent them home. They were good. We we just, we got hot. And, you know, you've played and you've seen it. If you, all you got to do, we tell them, get in the tournament, play well for three days, four days. Anything can happen. And anything can happen. But the way it was set up, it was set up perfect. You could throw your one and two. On one weekend, if you won, go to the next weekend, throw them again. So, which isn't like it, you know, normal. That's not normal. Yeah. You know, normally it's not like that. I mean, at least in our league, it's not. You play one big tournament, six teams, and, you know, yeah. you can't you can't throw your number one and number two, you know, and back to, you know, back to back and play that type of game. So, 2021, then we go to Louisiana Tech, and, and they uh, they were good. And uh, they beat us up a little bit. And, um, and then we played Alabama the next day, and. Uh, Frank Dolan, South Jersey kid, uh, goes out and, and really battles, and uh, I think we lose four to one. And um, you know, I, I, we felt we felt even though we lost two, we felt good leaving there that we competed and uh, competed against an SEC school, and and it looked like we belonged, and uh, that that's important. That was important for us. And then of course we, that same team, you know, made it to to this year's region, uh, but in between we lost in the championship game. Uh, to uh, Canisius. So we, we were, we were in the championship game three straight years. That's awesome. And, and, you know, that Ruston regional, by the way, like you guys didn't even play NC state who, you know, very easily could have won the national title that year. Like, again, I, I always want to be careful not to take credit away from Mississippi state who was very much a deserving champion, but it would have been really fun to see Mississippi state and NC state play in that national title series, which it, it really felt like we were headed that way. All right. So, okay, we're going to fast forward to 2023 now. So, Yurk, I'm going to come back to you. You guys go to the Auburn Regional. And so, you know, I we it was so funny because I pride myself on a guy from the Northeast, and you've got this pitcher, Ryan Drumboski, whose name, like, I've mispronounced 27 different times and ways. And we've got pronunciation guides, and I'm like, Drumboski? Dr I, I mean, we, we said Drumboski. We, so you're going to fix that for me, Yurks, in a second. But he's pitching great. And so I'm going to give you my point of view on the game. He's pitching great. You guys are up three to two in the eighth. And all, you really have Auburn on their heels. I mean, they are really scrambling. You've out hit them. Like the, the final tally was 11 to four. You out hit them. I mean, you guys really, and, and Auburn was, I mean, they were crazy hot coming in. Like they had been dominant in the second half of the SEC season. It was a shocking eyeball, but Drumboski was just dealing. And so it's three to two and Auburn scores one in the eighth to make it three, three. And 
you know, it, it's, it's kind of like that heavyweight fighter that just finds his way off the canvas. You're like, ugh, Penn made a great run, but it's that it's pretty much done, right? Like you've seen this story a million times where the favorite just kind of doesn't fall, right? And, and, and I'm thinking, oh, man, that's a real missed opportunity. Like, what a game this was. And then you guys go into, I think it goes to 11 innings, and I'm sitting there watching, like, nobody told Penn this actually was over. Like, so Penn missed the memo. They didn't, they didn't realize that when Auburn tied this game, it was over. And and then, so so let me let me describe the 11th inning, Yerk. And then I want, I what I want from you is, like, memories from that game, turning points. You take it wherever you want. But this, I couldn't get over. And, and you might have to fix this a little bit. So in the 11th, your seven-hole hitter, a little old second baseman, you want to have you fill in his name. So the guy before him had walked. Your six-hole hitter walks. Your little, you know, 160-pound second baseman hits a double in the gap. Yeah, and Ryan then, Taylor. Ryan Taylor, there you go. Yeah. And then it goes drag, squeeze, squeeze. Next thing you know, you guys are up six to three. So I think, it was, I think this inning, this three-run inning was walk, double from the seven-hole hitter, Drag, bunt, squeeze, squeeze. Next thing you know, six three Quakers, and here we go. So go ahead, York. You take it. Take this wherever you want. Yeah. So it's it's interesting too because you know after the game, people were like, oh, you know, the small ball, it's great, and it was everything was so well executed, and it was. And I think people just assumed that we bunted great all year, and the fact is, we did it. <laughs> and, That's so great. And we and it, to be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of the sacrifice bunt. Um, if you look at our numbers, like in our league, I bet we had the fewest sack bunts in, in, in the conference. Um, but I just felt like the situation dictated it. And, um, we, you know, we had a couple good matchups and they made a pitching change and they brought in a left-hander. We were left on left, the one safety squeeze with first and third. So it, and you're right. It was, a, it was a drag. Um, it got us in the first and third and it was a safety squeeze that they tried to flip to the plate. Didn't work. They flip the ball over the catcher's head. So it wound up going first and third. They make a pitching change. They bring in a young left-hander. And we've got a left-hander up, Cole Palace. And I'm, it was funny because our, our third base coach, he comes over to the dugout during the pitching change. He goes, looks at me, he goes, hey, we, we got to do this again, right? And I said, yeah, go for it. So it worked out left on left, and Palace made a good bunt. And the next thing you know, you know, three, three uh, successful bunts in a row, and we wound up getting out of there with a win. But uh, – I think it's, it speaks to the resiliency of that team last year and the leadership. Um, I thought it was excellent all year. Um, you know, at one point, as you alluded to, we, it was three, two and the bases are loaded full count, two outs. And we walked in the tying run, I believe. And I mean, if there, there, if there were 6,500 people there in the park and at the structure, it was packed. I mean, you couldn't, I was, I was trying to chirp at the umpire two pitches before that. And I just realized, listen, it's it, it. He can't. He. I couldn't hear the guy next to me at that point. Um, you know, and we and we hung together. And it, again, a credit to that team. And you know, we got out of there with a win. And I don't. Again, I don't think many people in that park thought we were. We had a shot at beating Auburn that night. And you could really sense um, in the stadium is the longer that game went. Where where Jumbo, It's Dromboski, by the way. You had it Drombosky. right. Yeah. The longer he like settled in and just started making pitches, because I've seen him do it all year. He was the Ivy League pitcher of the year last year as a sophomore. And we just liked how we matched up. Like they had some talented kids in that lineup, but we felt like as you got to the bottom of the order that they could be pitched to, especially seven, eight, nine. Um, you know, and again, we liked our bullpen. So we felt like we could match up a little bit and things just worked out really well. And, you know, we got out of there with a win. So great. Oh, man, that, that was just a I mean, you just you're watching that game and you're thinking, man, this just makes me proud of college baseball. It was such a great college baseball game. And again, like Auburn was a was a, you know, as, as much a participant in that as, as your guys were. It was just it was everything we love about the sport. So I'll come back to you, York, in a second. And we'll I want to kind of finish the regional because it the, the drama didn't end there for you guys. I mean, it was really an, a really compelling regional. So so, Barry, you guys go to Conway. You're going to play Coastal. And this was one of the crazier games of the tournament. Liam Doyle, who's now at Ole Miss, is a freshman All-American. I think he's from the Northeast. He might even be from New Jersey. And uh, maybe he's from Pennsylvania. I don't know. He's from somewhere north, I think. Um, mm. Yeah, he's dealing against you guys. He throws six innings, no hitter. You guys are getting no hit through six innings of your regional game. I believe you're down six to nothing. And then five. five. 
five nothing. Okay. Five so nothing. you take it. You take. Feel free to touch up what I just said, and then you take it from there. What happened in that first game against Coastal? One versus four game. Well, he's throwing an amazing game, um, and one of the things that we try to do, if we're not going to hit him, at least force him to go deep as, as deep a count as you can. You mm-hmm. know, to try to to try to get. You know, get him to a hundred pitches in six innings, or get to sixty and three. Some are some. Those are two two numbers we look at. We try to look at. He had ninety nine pitches, I believe, after the six. But I I did not think they would take him out. But when they did take him out, my thinking was, and again, I don't know what what uh, Coach Gilmore what was the plan was, but I I figure it's five to nothing. You got nine outs to get. You can bring that young man back maybe on Monday if you need to. You know, this is a Friday night, I believe, right? It's a Friday night or mm-hmm. Thursday night. It's Friday night. Friday night. Uh, yep. So he he can come back, um, you know, maybe on Monday. If we don't, you know, we go to the seventh inning and we don't want to waste. So we start the inning, they bring in a reliever. Um, I mean, you're, you're trying to get <laughs> – we're trying to get a hit. I mean, trying to get on base. <laughs> Um, I mean, we're not really, I don't, you know, we're, I mean, we're not panicking. We're not panicking. We're not, we're not, you know, frustrated, but we we're we're a veteran team. We're a mature team, especially offensively. So we've been in these, these games before a little different 5,000 people, you know, but, but we feel good about ourselves going in. He, the pitcher throws eight straight balls. So now it's first and second. Uh, and then uh, Socrates Bardazzo gets a base hit. So now that's a hit. And then we proceed at some, that's, that's three guys, 11 more guys bat. And it was hit after hit after hit and everything, you know, we had the one ball bounce over to third er, herb Jordan herb hits one over to the third baseman's head. I believe they thought we were going to bunt. It was first and second. The score was five to two. They, they moved him up just, just enough just in case. It was the eight hitter and he hit a high chopper, went over his head. And of course, you know, around the bases we go. Uh, then a fresh kid Hartman hits one down, doubles down the right field line. Now we're back at the top of the order. And here we go. The, when, when you know it's going good is when you hit the ball back to the pitcher, it, it, it deflects off his glove. Scotty Shaw hits a ball up the middle, not too hard, two strikes. And it gets just enough by him where he's going to beat it out. That's when, you know, you know, it, things are going to go or going your way. And, and this is just, it's, it's hard to stop on the other side. And they had to bring in their, their closer, you know, um, we scored nine runs in, in the seventh inning. So it's nine to five. So now we're trying to get to our third team, all American Danny Kerwin, you know, we're thinking, okay, can we get through the seventh? And then get to the eighth and have him ready. So we bring in a reliever. He gets one out, gets gives up a hit, then he gives up a home run. Then we're like, we got to get Danny in. So we put him in. Some somehow anyway. It's hard to 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 give you step by step because so many things happened. So we're it's nine to seven, but it ends up in the ninth inning. They have bases loaded. It's it's ten to ten. And they hit a pop up, and then we go to the eleventh, and uh, we sc- we score two, and then we go to the bottom. Is it bottom eleventh? I think I'm I think yep. I'm right. Is it the eleventh? Mm-hmm. And then um, they we can't we can't get them out, can't make a play. And Danny Kerwin, I mean, it's no there's nobody else going to warm. There's nobody else coming in. That's it. I mean, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're just he's he's the guy. I mean, we're and Richie Sicka. Who who sat on the bench the entire game, uh, came in late for defense, uh, did bat in that in that tenth inning or that eleventh inning, bunted, advanced to Irby, um, advanced Irby to second, who scored on John Volpe's base hit, and then we ended, and then John stole second and scored on a Scatini hit that gave us an eleven to nine lead. But anyway, it's eleven to ten. Sick is in center field for defense, and makes the you know at least the sports center thought was the number one play of the night. And um, I mean, that, that, I mean, you can't end the game any better than that. Um, but it, it was fun. I, I actually stayed fairly calm, believe it or not, John, you, you probably have a hard time believing that, but I, I was pretty calm. Um, 
it was just fun. I don't know what I'll, any other way to say it. We're, we're playing, you know, what I think is one of the best teams in the country yeah. in front of a huge crowd. Uh, we're right there. Our guys are, are excited. It's emotional. I mean, there was nothing about that, um, that game that, um, that you would take away and say there was anything negative about it. And, and, and I told them all at the end of the game, you, I don't care as long as you live you will always remember this game. No matter what happens tomorrow or the next day or next year or 10 years from now, you will never forget that game. And that's, and that's exciting. Yeah. It, it, that game was like five games in one. It was, it's funny. One of the first shows we did this fall, Blair DeBoard, we talked to the 2013 Missouri guys who um, or Kansas State guys. Blair DeBoard works at Missouri now as an associate AD. But Blair was a catcher on that Kansas State team. They won the Big 12. They won a regional. They played in the Super Regional. And he just talked about the Super Regional with Oregon State. He felt like he's he knows his career is going to end. You know, he's not going to be a professional player. And he's like, all these guys, we're, it's like we're all at the height of our superpowers in baseball, right? Like, we're never going to play. Most of us, this is like the best baseball we're ever going to play. And I think for both of your teams, I'm watching that and I'm thinking, man, like, this is as good as college baseball gets. Like, these kids are playing at such a high level right now. And, you know, I, I would also say, Barry, Danny Kerwin was so fun. Like, he's animated on the mound. but And, and also, it, it, it made my heart sing that Richie Sicka made the final out like that's a name we don't get in the southwest like that's very much a northeast name they don't yeah. they're, Ricky R Richie Sicka's are not born in Phoenix Arizona they're born in New Jersey so great uh so hey so let's keep going in these regionals so Yerk, let me come back to you so the Auburn regional has now been turned absolutely inside out southern Mississippi was a team that was controversially not a host they're there as the two seed They've lost to Samford, who had this crazy story. They had to win three games in 24 hours just to get out of the SoCon. You guys have upset Auburn, thanks to Drombo and others, obviously. And now you're in the Samford game. Uh, tell me what you remember about that game. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I think we got out to an early lead. Um, you know, we were swinging the bats pretty good. Um, and uh, Cole Zafira was awesome. You know, he was our number two all year. Um, I think he wound up going like eight innings. I don't know if he walked a guy, had like eight or nine punch outs, I believe. Uh, just really commanded his fastball. They really had trouble with him. And then late, I think we went to our bullpen and I think we made a couple mistakes. They hit a two run homer. And then the next thing you know, um, it's a one run game in the ninth. And it's like, oh man, we did this the other night. I wish we could have just, you know, <laughs> finished this one and made it a little easier. Um, and then, you know, we, we were shifting a lot that game and we were, we had Ryan Taylor, our second baseman. It's, there's a man on second with two outs. So the tying run is at second base. They hit a ball right past the pitcher where we have Ryan Taylor back behind second base. Now, Ryan Taylor's only playing second base. He, he had played left field most of the year Our shortstop. Thursday practice before the regional start, Davis Baker got back spasms and could not play shortstop for us in the regional. So we had to move some guys around. Um, so anyway, ball hit hard, back behind second base. Ryan Taylor catches it. He's kind of off balance. He makes a throw wide of the bag. Our first baseman, Ben Miller, sees that the throw is going to pull him off the bag to his glove side. The, the runner on second, the third base coach started to wheel him, expecting maybe like a long throw. Ben Miller, our first baseman, sees the throw is going to be wide. He comes off, meets the ball, and looks directly at third base. Now, all of a sudden, this kid's about 25 feet from third base. And Ben Miller's holding the ball, waiting for the kid to make a move. He goes back to third. Ben fires a strike to Wyatt Hensler, kind of puts a tag on him. It's bang, it's bang, bang. And they have to actually go to a replay to review it. Not enough to overturn it. They call them out. Quakers win, and now we're we're two and zero in the regional. But yeah, it was a uh, an interesting way to end the game. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and again, it's like like we're watching this, and it's like this regional can't get any more compelling, right? Like to to your point, York. Just to recap it, you guys beat Auburn. Now you're winning five nothing in this game. Headed to the eighth, it's five mm -hmm. nothing in the they're the home team. 
and they score two in the eighth. So now it's getting a little anxious. They score two more in the ninth. And then, you know, so you guys end up winning that game five, four that ends crazy. And uh, so anyway, next thing you know, you're two and oh, you're one win from a super regional. It's just crazy. So Barry, let me come to you. So Ryder now has not taken down Coastal in an all time game. You're playing Duke, who, you know, under Chris Pollard have been remarkable in road regionals. They've won three now. Uh, you guys are, it's 1-1 one, one against Duke headed to the ninth. So you could take me to the ninth. You could, you could take me anywhere you want. But this it wasn't like Ryder just had this great win against Coastal and then you guys took the swag and went home. Like this game with Duke was a was an, a great one. Yeah, it was. Um, I think one of the, we stepped back a couple, a couple like even before the regional, uh, we played Duke in the midweek. Mm. Uh, they when they were hot, they were hot. They were they were ranked uh, sixth, eighth, tenth, whatever poll you wanted. So we go down and play in the midweek uh, after a weekend series with, at Iona, and we go down and play them, and we beat them two to one. Second game on a Wednesday night, we're winning three to two in the eighth. And they score two in the bottom half of the eighth to go up, and then uh, they they bring in their their I can't I forget his name, big left-handed kid, freshman left-hander, December seventeen. I don't know his name, but I I knew who he was then, and <laughs> he was tough. And so he finished the game. So anyway, so now we we fortunately win our conference, which is is another story. But anyway, now we're at the selection show. Coastal, we had a feeling it was coming up, and we come up, and our guys are just totally excited. Well, the number two seed is Duke, and then we kind of gave it the – I mean, I know that – I mean, gave it the old man. I mean, because we could run into these guys again, and I think if anybody else is there, I mean, you pick anybody. It was Duke. We weren't intimidated. We weren't afraid. Yeah. There wasn't anything that they – and you know what? I – when, you know when you play midweek games, and you know this, John, sometimes you play those big schools, you see guys midweek, they're not their guys. It's a lot of times. I'm not saying I'm not disrespecting the guys that they do use. But it's not their guys. They use their guys because I watched them the next weekend against Georgia Tech, and they used the same people. It was like, it was kind of like how they did things. I mean, Pollard would bring them in, pitch them a couple, you know, maybe go through the order. They'd throw an inning or two, then they'd bring another guy in. He was really good. They were all good. So we had faced all their guys and I, and I told our guys, you know, I'm, you know, you know, I said, Hey, you know, you should be proud of yourself. The way you battled that team is is going to, they were going to, they're going to, at that time, they were going to host, you know, they were, they were in the running for yeah, a host. Spot. Yeah. And, uh, but we saw them come up on the board and, um, and I'm like, okay, you know, if we, I don't know if we can beat coastal, but we did. So now we got Duke and they're throwing um, a guy we hadn't seen, but he only pitched two innings. Um, but we weren't, we weren't afraid. It's one to one. We, we go to the, 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 uh, we were the, we were the home team, believe it or not, yep, uh, the yep. way they do it. Um, they, uh, the kid, uh, center fielder, Giacomo, I just, I think, I can't the think Giacomo, of yeah, 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 yeah. Hits one in left center field. We had kind of had him most of the, most of the, you know, we, we handled him for the most part. He doubles, they move the runner, they get him to third to score on a sack fly, they go up two to one. Well, they got the big right-handed kid. Uh, I, I don't know his name, but he's throwing 95, 96 miles an hour. Fran O'Shell, yeah. Number, number 31. Yep. And um, there was no uh, – you didn't have to guess what he was throwing most of the time. But we draw a walk. Luke Lesh, Gloucester Catholic guy, draws the walk. So we uh, pinch run. And then so and then uh, our big hitter, O'Donnell, gets him out. And then uh, Socrates Bardazos comes up. Who has power? Who can be scary? Uh, he can hit. He can hit those guys. Played in the draft league, so he's not afraid. He walks. We pinch hit, pinch run there. So we got two guys that can run. Uh, Jack Wentz gets fisted on. I don't know what the count was, but it's a little weak ground ball to second. We move up to second and third, and then Jordan Irby comes up our shortstop, and with two strikes, he hits the ball down the right field line, and off the bat, I thought, oh man, it's it's going to drop because if it drops, we win. We we beat Duke. We're gonna beat him, and it landed. Right. I don't know. If people, if some people say it was like this far, and I, I think it was a little further than that. It's more like a foot or two, but then he ends up striking out, and we lose two to one. But 
for it and I, of course we we i mean i almost replay this in my mind like uh, at least two or three times a week especially when i'm at practice i mean that close little rider little rider you know who a lot of people don't even know where it's at you know we're we're a couple feet from playing in a regional championship and could we could we get out of that thing i don't know because we we really don't have the depth in the pitching um that these other teams have but they would have had to play each other and i and i would have i would have been i would have loved to have been in the same situation that john got himself in which was which was awesome we were we were following along with that and uh but yeah that was an, an exciting uh, there was a photo taken of uh, anthony pascal he's pinch runner he's coming into home his feet are off the ground he's reaching up with his left arm like please like the old carlton fisk please be fair <laughs> And all of the Duke guys on the bench are leaning over, looking down the This is going to drop and the game's going to end. Because you know it's over if it drops. So that picture uh, is, a, is a, a great um, a memoir in the sense that that will capture that moment in that second. And, um, I mean, we just wow. held our heads high. And I, I just told them how proud I was of them. And, uh, well, we played Duke three times, two to one, four to three, and two to one. And we won one of those. So. We felt That's pretty awesome. good about where we were. And then, of course, you know, if you, I don't even need to come back to the third game. Coastal kind of beat us up a little bit the next day, yeah. and, uh, and they moved on. But uh, it was a great run. Yeah. Hey, and that's a perfect segue. So, York, let me come to you. And, you know, like, so, you, you know, you guys are 2-0. and you, Southern Miss has come back through the loser's bracket. They, they had a heck of a team, right? They hosted a Super Regional. That's how good they were. Um, you know, the first game – they they got put a big number on you guys. The second game, which is the winner goes to the Super Regional game, that game was, you know, like we're watching it intently thinking, man, there's there's some moments in here where Penn could pull this thing off. Ultimately, USM does. Here's where I want to go with this as we start to, you know, start to wrap up a little bit. You know, your team goes two and two in this regional. I mean, you really represented yourself so well. Like, I, I guess just your, your, as you, you know, maybe a month later, two months later, maybe now you're, you think about that, what that team accomplished. And, and also from a prism of, hey, like, this is a school, this is an Ivy League school in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Like, you know, as far as winning a regional, you've got every disadvantage you could ever want and, and then some. You know, what, what did that mean to you as far as like that? Like, this is a cold weather school in the Northeast that is, you know, a, a pitch or two away from winning a regional. Yeah, I think um, you know the first game against Southern Miss too. It was it was three two going into the eighth, the ninth inning. Mm. You know, and uh, people people uh, bring this the one play up. You know, it they brought a left hander in this kid Luke Storm that came in in the fifth inning, and he, he was probably the best left handed slider we saw all year. He really shut us down. But there was a moment in the uh, I believe it was the fifth or sixth inning where we had bases loaded, full count, runners moving, where our hitter got called for a pitch clock violation. Oh, I remember and that. And got called Brutal. out. Um, now, who knows what would have happened. But, you know, that we wound up getting beat, you know, I think like an eight spot in the ninth or something like that. But you're right. I mean, um, you know, and then the next day we came back. And I'll tell you what, Southern Miss, that lineup, oh, what a pain. I mean, one through nine, not an easy out. And, like, even if you get to, like, those seven, eight, nine guys, they had this little catcher, this left-handed kid, just a pain in the butt. Two strikes, foul you off, foul you off, lean into a pitch. I mean, you had they really made you work. I mean, probably when, when you think about team offense and a team really doing things together and helping each other out, they they were they were a good good group, really well coached. But yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, um, you know, I don't know. I don't think is as great of a season as it was. It was probably the the best season in the history of Penn baseball, and they've you know we've been playing baseball, I guess, at Penn for almost 150 years now. We're coming up on an anniversary, um, you know, and that team ac accomplished quite a bit. Um, I, you know, I, I said earlier, I think a lot had to do with some of the the older guys on that team. Um, and it, you know, I, I did feel when, when we walked off the field that there really were no regrets with that group because down to the last out, you know, when, when we were eliminated, those kids really left it all the way out on the field. And, and I made sure, sure I told those guys that and, I felt like for our program, you know, it, it, we've been really knocking on the door for a while. Um, so it was nice to see the success, obviously, on a national level. And, you know, I think Barry would agree with this, too. Like some of the smaller schools, some of the mid-majors, you, you, you don't have as many opportunities. You can have a great year 
And if you don't win your tournament, chances are you're not getting in a large bid. So, you know, you, you really got to make it count when you have have those opportunities. And I felt like last year's group really did that. Um, you know, they had a bitter taste in their mouth in 22. And they wanted to show everybody how good they were. And, you know, I just told them, like, when you guys walk around, keep your heads up high. It was an, it was an unbelievable year. Um, I was just really proud of those guys. And it's I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's helped recruiting because – you know, mm-hmm. we, we recruit nationally and, you know, I, I'm, you're in, I'm in Houston or Dallas or, you know, assistant coaches out on the road. People, people know where, where Penn is now. Um, so it definitely helped from that standpoint, you know, people, Oh yeah. The quake show, you know, we were walking through the so airport great. and yeah. So uh, it was, it was a fun run. It really was. Yeah. Penn baseball, by the way, has an outstanding Twitter account too. I don't know who is responsible for that Yerk, but whoever that is, that person does great work. And um you know, and, and I would say this, like for your program, you know, I, I think we've always thought of Penn baseball as, you know, I think of Mark DeRosa and I think of Doug Glanville and I'll continue to think of those guys. But and I don't say this to be corny, but now, like I have a team to think about, like that 2023 team, I'm going to have a tough time forgetting about them like that. Th- those moments from that regional were just yeah, like that that was incredible television. It was just, man, it was awesome. How about Barry, similar to you, you know, like same thing, like Ryder, um, you know, Ryder's had big leaguers, Ryder's had first round picks before, but um, you know, what your team did, I, I'm just you, you kind of started to go down this road a, a moment ago, but you know, what that means for kids from Jersey and and the Northeast. I mean, I, I think people that pay attention know that New Jersey's got outstanding baseball, but I think you guys really put a punctuation mark on that last year. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Yeah, we did. Um, I, I think one of the things that I um, when I went to the press conference uh, on the way out, I wanted to make sure that everybody, you know, knew or knows that uh, Ryder's been good for a long time. Yeah, much longer. I mean, before I got there, um, they went to the World Series in 1967 with uh, oh, Tom wow. Petroff, Tom Petroff and Tom Petroff left Ryder, went to Northern Colorado, took them to the world series. I think he was the first coach to take two different college, two different college programs to the world series. You, you'd have to do the research, but I think that's correct. Tom Petroff, he's a hall of famer, Sonny Patera hall of famer went to the regionals uh, a number of times. So we've Ryder's been 15 times and it's been four times since I've been there and 11 times prior. So it has, it has a strong history. And, um, you know, we, we can't, and I, and I, you know, Penn Ivy league, it's apples and oranges with us. We are, uh, we are a developmental, uh, New Jersey for the most part, every player on our team, for the most part, a few Pennsylvania trickled in, we got a, one guy here or there, but it's New Jersey. Um, and what I've, what I found after making all the mistakes, Get the kids, get the kids that want to come to Ryder, get the kids that know Ryder, get the kids that uh, are good, that will develop, that will work hard. And and if you go back and look at any of the seasons that we've had that have been successful, it all has some of those qualities. I mean, we, every time we try to think we're big or we think we're going to be, you know, you know, Rutgers or or, or Virginia, or, we st- it doesn't work doesn't work you know we get a trickle junior college here and there every now and then you know maybe a four-year transfer every now and then but we're going to make our 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 way uh with good high school players that stick together and then and then we try to develop them and they and they want to be at rider and they want to come to practice and they want to work and um it that's that's really the that's really the formula that i've found I did not know this. In 2021, somebody came to me and said, uh, one of the parents who, who was a great supporter, he said, you know, every starter on that team's from New Jersey. And I, I said, I, you know, yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't know that. But it, it, we were right. Uh, it was all New Jersey. And we and we brought in one. We brought in a reliever who was from Iowa. Go figure, right? But he was a, mm. a, tra- a four-year transfer from George Washington. Uh, which, you know, we knew some people, but it, but the, the long and short of it is everybody basically on that roster is a Jersey is a jerk was a Jersey player or maybe a Pennsylvania kid. So that's, that's where our recruiting is. So people in Jersey know us. I've been, like I said, I've been in Jersey for 30, for 31 years. 
So uh, we have a pretty good uh, reputation and um, we, we don't get in too many battles with schools. Uh, we don't really battle Penn or Princeton. You know, we're battling Monmouth, uh, Marist, you know, mm-hmm. schools in our league for the most part. Uh, so we just need to be, be patient and uh, the kids uh, get the right kid and uh, get the right people and, and work hard. And we play a certain way. And, and it, it, for the most part, it, it has worked. It has worked. And, uh, and I don't speak, I don't know how long we got, but Penn, J- John's teams the last two, two years were, were really good. I mean, we played a midweek uh, both years and uh, tremendous talent. Uh, especially the 22 team. I mean, I didn't, I, you know, the 22 team I thought was better than the 23 team, but I, John can answer that. But uh, I mean, I thought they were, they were amazing. And this was the first year Ivy League had a tournament, whereas the year before it was the best of three, if I'm not mistaken, John, am I right? So yeah, the, 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 the dynamics were a little different. You get into a tournament, but they, they've been, they've been really good. And uh, I expect them to continue to do that as long as he's there. Yep. Uh, it's so good. I just, I think, you know, and, and, you know, get, getting back to your guys' roots, I mean, Gloucester County and, and, you know, Gloucester Catholic and Brooklawn and, uh, you know, just all this, you know, it, it is New Jersey's a state with incredibly rich baseball tradition. And, you know, you know, talking about American Legion baseball, I, you know, I think about Pennsylvania, New Jersey, the American Legion baseball ha- had been so strong there forever and ever, but, you know, and I also, I, I'm so glad we did this because, Last year's NCAA tournament was so great for our sport. And, and it's very easy, as we should, to think about LSU, how captivating they were, and Florida, how captivating their team was, Jack Caglione. I mean, who doesn't want to watch him? Uh, you know, Oral Roberts. But I, I also think Oral Roberts is a great example of you guys where these programs that are out there in college baseball where they've got really good really good sense of self, right? Like their identities are super locked in, like your two programs are. And uh, it, it, again, it, like I, I'm so glad we got to retell these stories because we do. They get told really, it, really quickly when they happen in the moment. It's right. so fun, you know, after the dust settles to be able to redo them. And, and you know, so many special kids and special performances. Um, just awesome. So I, I really appreciate you guys doing this. This was great. Um, yeah, let, let's cap it right there. Let me as we wrap, let me do this. I want to say thanks to our our our, our sponsor, our, our presenting sponsor, Netting Pros. These guys are awesome. Really appreciate them helping us put this on. I am so pumped about some of the future guests. So uh, in the next couple of weeks, Chuck Jerome and Matt Hobbs, two of the premier assistant coaches in the SEC, kind of look at, at at that league through the eyes of some assistant coaches that have been in those wars um, and you know have have coached at the highest level of our sport. Tom Holiday is going to be one of our future guests. I mean, the Holidays have become the first family of American baseball. So Tom Holiday has taken a team to Omaha as an assistant coach and as a head coach. His son, Josh, has taken a team to Omaha. His son, Matt, played a bazillion years in the big leagues. And now Tom's grandsons, Ethan and Jackson. Jackson's the number one prospect in all of baseball. And Ethan's the number one prospect in the class of 2025. So even though we love to give TH a hard time, I mean, come on now. We're talking about three generations of pretty good baseball. So anyway, super excited for that. So Yurk and, and Barry, thank you guys so much for doing this. This was super fun. Um, I, again, I, I, I can't wait for these Sunday night calls, and they never disappoint. So that's it. Everybody listening, really appreciate it. Have a great week, and we will catch you next time on Sunday Night Conversations.